Hi class, I'm here to talk to you today about a very serious topic. I'm here to tell you about drugs and alcohol and why they're bad, okay? Actually, they're not. Drugs aren't bad. Drugs are just ways that people use ingesting substances to alter their conscious experience. We haven't gone through quite the levels of conscious experience yet in terms of what the brain is doing, but basically the brain is doing one of two things. It's turning on or it's turning off a system. Drugs can act as antagonists or agonists and they can upregulate, they can help provide more of a neurotransmitter or less is the basis of it, which means that it will change a, a small biological mechanism in your brain that then provides for you a different sensory experience. Drugs have a, a hugely political, religious, and societal significance, and so it's important to understand them in and of themselves, not with a preconceived notion that somehow they are bad, good, the answer, and also not to dismiss them as just a simple thing. Uh, it's a complex thing. Um, we see animals even using, ingesting drugs to seemingly induce differing states of consciousness. And uh, it's, it's tough to anthropomorphize animals' use of drugs, but clearly when we put them in human laboratories and we offer them the opportunity to take certain kinds of drugs, they will even ignore their natural biological ne needs um, to pursue that. So that's a sort of a model for what can happen when drugs get out of hand in biological organisms is that the need for that drug becomes unmoored, untethered to uh, the individual's real need to thrive and to be healthy. Um, I'm pretty sure all of you know that. Okay, so different types of drugs that people use are central nervous system depressants and central nervous system stimulants. Those are drugs that are making the brain work faster or making the brain work slower. A very simple uh, understanding of this would be caffeine is a central nervous system stimulant. And lots of people use caffeine. I had some this morning. And then alcohol. Alcohol is a central nervous system depressant, right? So what it does is it acts to lower the brain functioning. Um, and the way it does that is a complicated thing. You can take uh, a biological psychology class and learn more about GABA and how GABA is um, an inhibitory neurotransmitter. We also have other things like illicit drugs. Not the, the two drugs I mentioned before are legal. Here in California, it's not illegal to smoke marijuana. So marijuana is another central nervous system depressant. It lowers the brain's normal functioning. There are plenty of drugs that do that. Opioids also do that. So prescription medications, even legal prescription medications, things like um, if you're taking Ritalin or you're taking like a methylphenidate, that's um, the methamphetamines are drugs that uh, are central nervous system stimulants. You might be taking hallucinogens. Hallucinogens uh, tend to be nervous system stimulants, some of them can be nervous, central nervous system depressants, and what they do is they depress the thalamus, which is our brain sort of filter for sensory input. And if you depress the filter, so the filter can't take all the sensory input that we're getting and then limit what goes to the brain for sensory perception, you have these hallucinations, right? These sensations from outside of the physical world in terms of you didn't experience a stimuli that was changing the world. All you experienced was the perception of it um, because your brain is overwhelmed with sensory input. Things of that nature are uh, everything from even, even mild hallucinogens. Some people might call them psychedelics. Other folks call them entheogens. Some folks think they're extremely dangerous. Some folks think that they are uh, relatively benign or even extremely helpful panaceas. I tend to be a bit conservative on drug use but I also understand that all cultures everywhere have utilized, uh, actually there's one culture that, that we know does not utilize something to change their brain chemistry, and that's mostly out of uh, the context that they're in. Um, all cultures studied everywhere use some form of ingested um, stimulant or depressant to alter their brain's neurochemistry and experience changes in consciousness. Even children do this. You see them in the, in the, out in the yard spinning around. What are they doing? They're trying to change that 
conscious experience in their mind, getting dizzy, right? So getting dizzy is an altered state of consciousness. But the people that are using drugs like hallucinogens oftentimes are altering their states for a, for a purpose. And I think that that's a really important thing is that you have a goal for why you're using drugs. Uh, a lot of you are college students, that's 18 to 24 year olds. And that's the typical age where a lot of people experiment with different types of drugs. You know, when you get to be as old as I am, you don't experiment with your types of drugs. I like alcohol and caffeine. Those are my types of drugs. They're really, that's what I use. And I have a goal for using them. I don't go wantonly into using, ca just drinking caffeine all day long because there are some consequences to it. I don't wantonly go drink anymore until uh, in, I'm in a stupor because there are consequences to that. And so most often in, in younger ages, people who are most, most of you in this class are going to be in that 18 to 24 year old range. Some good advice is to have a goal for whatever you're doing, to have a, a desired effect. Because if you have a goal, then what you can do is you can say, well, did that use of that drug, that particular experience meet the expectations I had or did it not? Um, so often, especially with the use of alcohol, what, what we see is, is that people get alcoholic myopia. This is, uh, myopia is the term in vision for short-sightedness. And they short-sighted in terms of not their, their visual capabilities, they're, they're capable of seeing, but their short-sightedness with, with regard to their uh, consequences of their actions and what's going to happen in the future based on what it is that they're doing now. Um, should I have another beer? The answer is probably no. If you ask that question, should I have another beer? Probably not. Um, so again, have a goal and then moderation. Goal and moderation. If you have this desire to seek these peak experiences through drugs, that's a, a real indicator of potential danger for abuse, addiction, and dependence. So be careful with that because this is a serious issue. You know, we have a, an opioid crisis in our country where tons of people are taking prescription medications that they probably got legitimately for some, they had some goal, some usage. It wasn't like people were just like, hey, take this oxy and see what happens. That's probably not what happened to most people. Most people probably got hooked on these drugs, got dependent on these drugs, started to abuse these drugs when they experienced a real crisis and they had a goal for its use. But then what ended up happening is that this cycle of needing to have more of the drug for the same effect and not transitioning away from the use of the medication, the physical chemistry of altering your brain into a, a more sustainable way of altering your brain chemistry, which there's tons of ways to do. We're going to talk all about drugs and all about other ways that you can alter your brain's chemistry. Um, Michael Pollan is a famous author and he wrote a great book on how to change your mind, which is not what you think. It's actually about the use of hallucinogens, DMT, ayahuasca, um, even things like MDMA, um, that's ecstasy for those of you that aren't up on um, methyl deoxymethamphetamines, um, ketamine, hydrochloride. Uh, these are all drugs that people take in order to experience hallucinations, to experience altered states of consciousness. Uh, and the book is fantastic as he chronicles not only his own use of these drugs, but experts who understand these drugs and then uh, who help guide people through their, um, their psychedelic experiences. Again, I'm not a big fan of them. And so I would suggest you not use psychedelic drugs. I would suggest that you attempt to find ways naturally to alter your brain instead of through a chemist set that you attempt to find ways to do it through finding highs in your own life. And um, a couple of things that I experienced, you know, these extreme peak experiences had to do with travel and seeing natural beauty and being in relationship. Those are the transcendent moments that your brain chemistry can experience without the use of DMT, uh, a, a real peak experience. And so if that's what you're looking for, um, I really urge you to explore how to do that first as a young person through um, social, family, relational connections, through uh, exploration, adventure, um, extreme sports, um, uh, seeking natural beauty, seeing uh, the world, um, opening your mind, going to new cultures, new places. Rather than just sticking at your house and 
taking ayahuasca or, or taking some psilocybin mushrooms, that's not the peak experience you're looking for. I think you want one that's more sustainable, one that's more able to be brought back. Remember, the hero story is home away home, that you, you're at home, you wanna go away and do something, and then you come back as a transformed individual that then helps the community. Um, so drugs are a complicated topic. Um, there are a lot of people that have different opinions about them. I again told you I'm, I tend to be conservative about drug use, not as a, you know, a teetotaler or someone who um, eschews all use of drugs, but I, I've seen effects that are really tragic in people who overuse drugs and then don't understand what goals they have and don't find ways to moderate their use. So recognize there's a propensity for that. Um, I'm also somebody who's, I, I don't, I'm not somebody who thinks like if you are, you know, an alcoholic that, you know, like you could never have another drink again, but maybe you can't, I don't know, I'm not you, you're somebody who needs to be in charge of your life and figure out for you what's going to be sustainable, what's going to be promoting the best thriving in your life. And so this is a time where in your earlier years, you might have some opportunities to experiment with drugs, but keep in mind that everybody has a different reaction to drugs. Um, you need to plan out your use. Don't just find yourself in a situation where someone's using drugs and they offer it to you and you say, oh, I'll try that. It sounds like a bad idea to me. Um, and, and be very clear about whether or not after the, the drugs effect has worn off, whether or not that was a positive experience for you and how you wanna incorporate that into what you do. Because most often, um, people that experiment with drugs don't end up abusing them and don't end up using them anymore. Um, people will settle into a more moderate and more sustainable usage of um, mind-altering substances. Um, and so that's something that you want to make sure that you're, you're keeping in mind. You are in control of what you put in your body and you should remain in control of it. Um, back to the opioid crisis. You know, here up in Trinity County, up north of here, um, there was a report, a report that um, came out of the, how many prescriptions were written for certain drugs. And it turned out that that county, um, that the physicians in that county had written more, prescription, more prescriptions for um, opioids than there were people in the county. Now, again, that sounds outlandish. Maybe the adjacent counties have highly populated areas close to Trinity County and those folks went to their closest uh, medical facility for their treatment. There, there could be all sorts of things. But really what we're finding is that when we study the data, prescription medications are being abused incessantly. Um, and also what we, when we ask law enforcement about uh, their experience with people who are utilizing um, drugs because of dependence and abuse, um, what they're seeing is that they're seeing that they're not taking the drugs as prescribed by the doctors. And that's something that's um, really an interesting take when you look at people, um, physicians know this, that when they prescribe, let's say they, I go to the doctor and I have an infection, and the doctor says, okay, uh, James, I'd like you to take this pill three times a day for the next seven days. And that physician knows the, the percentage of people who actually do that is like something like 60%. 60% of people actually fill the prescription and take the drug as they're ordered by their doctor. So there's 40% of people that, I don't know, for, for whatever reason, either don't fill a prescription and or don't take the medication. And so what we have is, is an incredible amount of drugs that are available from those filled prescriptions that aren't being taken, that then are available. Um, I think perhaps a way to do it is to have to account for the pills that were given instead of just getting prescriptions and say, you know, here's 100 100 oxycontins for you. You just had knee surgery, so um, I don't know why they'd give that for that. But we can find far better pain management strategies than opioids that just cause dependence and abuse and problems with re withdrawal. But let's say that's what happens. Doctor's orders. Here's 100 pills, and you're a tough person, and you go through your surgery, and you, you know, maybe you take a couple oxycontin after surgery to sort of deal with the pain. But then you're left with like say 80 pills. What should have to happen is that those pills are then 
reestablished some some accounting for where they are uh, in that uh, we could potentially account for more uh, of the abuse and how that happens in that stockpiling of those drugs and doesn't happen and that the the potential for uh, abuse and flooding the market is is a real problem now a lot of the issues that I have with uh, prescription medication is that there's a, a for-profit motive of the pharmaceutical industry you know here in the United States of America you're probably used to this but you see advertisements for pharmaceuticals that's illegal in most other countries it's actually illegal to advertise for a prescription medication so we have a strange situation where we're flooding the market with drugs and then we're telling people that these are the solutions to their problems and more often than not it's not the solution to your problem the pill that you're taking it's it's something that will buy time for you to heal or find you know comfort or you know just an, an analgesic to remove pain from you so that you can move on with your life they're not the solution um, and we'll see that especially especially with mental health um, and the treatment of mental health issues with drugs that have nothing to do with the etiology of your mental health crisis. Um, so other drugs that I haven't mentioned before are things like LSD, things like cocaine, um, these are uh, stimulants. Um, what else haven't I mentioned before? Um, Oh, methamphetamines, I believe I talked about methamphetamine use. Um, what's crazy is that the amount of prescriptions that we're giving to children who have prescription medication that have similar chemical reactions in the brain to things like methamphetamines are drugs um, like Adderall and the way that people are crushing them up and taking them not as the doctors have ordered. Um, you know, we've had to the physicians in the pharmaceutical industries have gotten together to try and make the abuse of these drugs um, less less easy to do by making extended release capsules and so instead of crushing them up and getting big highs really quick rushes uh, of a neurochemical change these XRs or these extended release uh, medications are really beneficial because they reduce the likelihood for um, taking it un in, in a way that doesn't um, coincide with how the physician has ordered you to take it. But again, you gotta be questioning, question your physician when they have, uh, when they're giving, you know, six year olds dextroamphetamine. That's the, the, the name for Adderall. Dextroamphetamine, that's the drug. And they're giving it to six year olds who they haven't evaluated. ADHD, right? This is one of those conditions that a physician doesn't even need to evaluate the child. They don't need to make a clinical observation of the child. They could talk to teachers and parents and and just prescribe a drug, dextroamphetamine, to a child, to a developing child's brain um, that they've never observed. They've never observed that child in the situation where there's an alleged problem. I think this is something we will look back on uh, with disdain in the future. All right, we're gonna talk about the stages of sleep. Um, when I was learning about this, they told us that you had four stages of non-REM sleep. Stage one, stage two, stage three, and stage four. Now what they're telling people is they really couldn't tell the distinction between stage three and stage four based on the EEGs. So you're going to learn, again, subject to change at the whims of new research and science and uh, the wind blowing. Uh, that there are three stages of non-REM sleep, and I'll get to what REM is in a second. But the three stages of non-REM sleep are uh, stage one, stage two, and stage three. They represent a descent into the activity of your normal brain uh, patterns of activity. When you're awake and alert, hopefully now watching a video, learning and preparing for uh, class, you are in a, a stage called beta, and we call it beta uh, we call these different stages uh, beta, alpha, those are your sort of awake um, stages. Beta is like your brain is active like it is now, hopefully alert and aware of what's going on around you. Alpha is like when you get into that state where you're kind of mm, meditative, drowsy, but uh, still awake. Calm, relaxed, breathing slowly, not moving a bunch. 
that's where you're going to get your brain into alpha. When you get into real sleep, we call those theta and delta. Um, and they, again, is a lowering of the normal firing of rate, uh, rate of neurons. So you have a spontaneous firing rate. Let's say it's 20 hertz. So that's cycles per second of how many cycles up and down you're going to have per second. That's happening when you're awake, alert, in between alpha and beta. When you get down into like theta, you're going down to like 10 hertz. So it's half that fast. When you're in delta, you're at like less than a hertz a second to four, four or five hertz per second. So your brain is really, really slow in terms of its normal activity and consciousness, which is you're taking this big break from normal conscious level uh, beta activity. So start out stage one sleep. Stage one sleep is like, uh, if I woke you up from that, uh, I'm watching your brain, you have an EEG on your brain and I'm watching on the little monitor, seeing these EEG little channels that have signals going across the little squiggly lines. If I saw that you got into stage one sleep from you know, the, the decreasing uh, frequency of those hertz, I'd wake you up and your experience would most likely be like this. You'd say, well, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't asleep, but I was almost asleep. So if you've ever felt that, like um, you're laying on the couch, you're watching the program, um, sorry, programs what old people call television or YouTube videos or whatever you watch, you're watching TikTok. So if you're just sitting there watching something and you drowse, you know, drowsy fall off to sleep, but you wake up and like it's the same show, but it's just a little bit further and you don't know what happened in the story, that's probably stage one sleep. Now, if you were in stage two sleep and I woke you up from it, again, we're getting from stage one is in like the right below the uh, alpha into these theta. If you're in stage two sleep, you have an architecture of your sleep that's a little bit different. And that architecture neurologists would call sleep spindles and K complexes. So a sleep spindle is you're going slow activity because you're in theta and then all of a sudden it'll go and it'll do a sleep spindle. It'll, it'll, for just a brief period of time, it'll start firing fast. And then again, you'll go back down. And then K complexes are these uh, sharp amplitude waves followed by a negative longer uh, amplitude wave. And those are K complexes. That's how you would distinguish those two. If again, if you're reading someone's EEG as they're falling asleep, you'd see these two distinctive patterns in their brains firing, in the neurons firing. 